You're listening to The Coffee Podcast. This is the Coffee Science Series. Coffee and liver health. I'm in Washington, D.C., somehow running a global organization from the top floor of my townhouse. That's Donna Cryer, the founder and CEO of the Global Liver Institute. She's our expert speaker on coffee and liver health. Her day-to-day looks like talking to patients with various types of liver diseases, talking to CEOs of companies to increase research in that space, and other efforts to increase understanding the topic of liver health so people like you and me can know more about their liver health and how to navigate it. So what does the liver have to do with coffee? Well, let's see. Is it fair to say your, your specialty is the liver? The podcast specialty is coffee. This is kind of the two worlds are colliding here. They go hand in hand if I am run the risk of adding another metaphor or body part um, into this. <laughs> but um, the coffee yeah. and, and the liver could not be better friends. Um, and that, okay. that relationship and that understanding um, and the science of it um, could not go further back. And um It has actually gotten me out of uh, a lot of trouble um, at a lot of social events. Coffee is really the only reason I have a social life because, as you can imagine, when you run the Global Liver Institute, um, people don't really, uh, you know, they start getting a little feeling a little guilty around the cocktail party. But then I normally (laughs) say to them, hey, you're probably doing something every day that is good for your liver. And they're like, what's that? They look so relieved. And I say, you, mm. you, you probably start your day with, you know, one, two, three cups of coffee. And they're like, yes, yes, I do. I love my coffee. I would never give up my coffee. I'm like, well, you're already doing something. Uh, one of the best things, in fact, to uh, promote your liver health. And so excellent. Okay. On, on that grounds, many a friendship is made and I am invited back to every cocktail and dinner party there is. <laughs> well, good to know. I I find personally, when it comes to health talk, uh, liver talk is is way down on the list. And I'm curious, why do you think that is, and why should we really care about talking about our livers? You know, everyone who has a liver is at risk for some type of liver disease, and I'll take a a second for that to register. That's everyone. Um, and you, just like you should be concerned about your heart health or your brain health, you should be concerned about your liver health. And, and the good news is that most of the things you can do to promote your, your liver health also benefit your heart and your brain. And, and so it's not like, ooh, some, you know, one more thing I have to think about. The mm-hmm. liver is really central. And that's just not my opinion. Um, it's held by by people who I hold in very high esteem. And I'll, and I'll give you an example of one. I ran into uh, Donna Karen, uh, the fashion designer, and I told her, you know, I, I run the Global Liver Institute. And she said, oh, the liver, the liver is essential. It is central to all body functions. And if I wasn't already in love with her, I am now, <laughs> um, it's because she does yoga and, you know, in many other cultures outside the United States, in, in India and in many parts of Asia, the liver, unlike the heart, the liver really is central. It does, you know, more than 500 functions. It has to do with everything from, you know, blood clotting to, to sex hormones. Um, it really is an amazing organ. Um, you know, writers like uh, Abraham Vergesi, you know, who wrote Cutting for Stone, writes about it, you know, lyrically. And so... One of the ways that I will know that the Global Liver Institute is successful is when people do start talking about the liver and do wax lyrical uh, in books, in poetry, um, and that uh, fashion designers, you know, other than Donna, um, start their conversations with the liver is a central and amazing organ. So those are just some of my goals. All right. So it sounds like we need to start thinking with our livers less, not maybe less with our hearts or our brains, but let's start thinking with our livers, at least for this episode as well. I want to ask you a question about the research. You know, a lot of us are just going to be listening to this episode, listening to this conversation, and just going off of what we hear 
how can our listeners know when research related to health is reliable and when should we be wary of, of, you know, I don't know, headlines that we see? I think this is a very important topic when, uh, you know, the integrity of our science uh, is, is often questioned and under attacked and when there is a lot of misinformation about a, a lot of different things in health or, or even when it seems to most people that they'll see a headline saying something is good for you one day and then saying it's bad for you another day. And so, you know, in coffee, we have had a consistent decades long concentration of study after study after study, all confirming that coffee is beneficial for your liver health and for your health overall. And, you know, some of the things that people should look at when considering information is, um, you know, who's conducting the study. So, you know, a lot of the data that we have about liver health is coming out from the World Health Organization, or it's, you know, compiled in some wonderful papers that the British Liver Trust has pulled together from the European Cancer Journal or journals of environmental toxicology and pharmacology or journals of clinical gastroenterology and hepatology. So very serious Mm -hmm. scientific journals, very serious scientific organizations. And then other things for people to look at besides, you know, the length of time that this is and the consistency and the confirming of of studies and the placement in well-respected journals is, you know, the number of, of people in those studies so where you have a study where they say, oh, well, 12 people benefited, that doesn't really prove anything. But in coffee, we have studies when there are a thousand people um, mm-hmm. or tens of thousands of people um, have been observed in different types of studies um, in different countries by different types of researcher. And so that should give people a lot of confidence in the body of coffee research because it's been done, it's sort of like the uh, the Christmas song, so many times, so many ways. There really should be confidence in the conclusions about coffee being positive for your liver and for your overall health. What kinds of links have been found about coffee and liver health? It's been really amazing when you think about it, because in so many cases, when patients ask, you know, is there something that I can eat or drink, something natural that I can do to help my disease process? There's usually there's usually nothing, nothing credible, nothing with scientific evidence behind it. But coffee has a significant body of evidence in terms of reducing the risk of, of scarring of the liver, that's often called fibrosis, Um, and cirrhosis. Coffee has even been shown to slow the progression of liver disease in some patients, irrespective of whether that coffee is filtered or instant or espresso. So it's, it's coffee itself. The fact that so many of the studies around coffee are in the oncology literature is because, you know, we've really been able to build up evidence around the anti-carcinogenic or the cancer preventing, particularly liver cancer preventing aspect of coffee. Um, And that's something so exciting. If it was a pharmaceutical product, you know, people would be paying a lot more than, you know, what, $5 $5 a cup at Starbucks or, um, <laughs> yeah. or what have you. Um, and so mm. it, it's really wonderful when I do have something to offer people that they can easily build into their lifestyle and that they want to and or may already or already be doing. That is usually not the case. So as a pa- or, you know, as somebody with a liver, if I was to say I need something or I'd like something that's just straight up good for me, good for my body or my liver specifically, you would feel extremely confident to say you need to start drinking coffee. I mean, you know, not including maybe if I had a sensitivity to caffeine or something like that. Yes. So um, I make decaf coffee for folks who are overly, I'm rather sensitive to to caffeine myself. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, wouldn't drink it right before bedtime. My husband is a physician though. And so he remembers his days as uh, as an intern and he says, oh, yes, a warm cup of coffee right before I go to sleep. Um, <laughs> you know what many of my board members 
who are hepatologists, which are physicians who specialize in the liver, they would typically tell their patients, you know, if you're drinking one cup of coffee a day, drink two or three and, and you know, listen to your body to see, you know, how uh, if it makes you over anxious or interrupts your sleep. Otherwise, one to five cups of coffee a day um, are, are safe for, for most people. And I feel you've, you've already kind of talked about how coffee can be used as uh, therapy for liver recovery. Uh, when you talked about its benefits against scarring in the liver and things like that, is that the idea behind therapy for liver recovery or how does, how does coffee play a role? Part and parcel of management of liver patients uh, for many physicians. I know one of my um, you know strongest fellow advocates in the fatty liver disease and NASH space and you know, fatty liver disease and NASH affects, you know, 25% of the global population at this point. And so uh, this friend of mine who had the more severe form of the disease, he had NASH, you know, confirmed in multiple studies, he had cirrhosis, Um, he used a lot of um, diet and exercise, he lost a considerable amount of weight. And as part of his you know, regular daily therapy, he drinks um, at least two cups of coffee a day. Um, Mm -hmm. And he believes that that is, you know, um, really essential to his, with, and his, you know, with his doctor's full knowledge and approval, that is part of their management um, of him and his case. And they feel, you know, that together with everything else, that is the reason that his fibrosis scores have been lowered and uh, why he has been now for several years gone from being a very sick patient to a very prominent, active patient advocate who before this pandemic situation was traveling all around the world. Coffee is one of those things that, um, and I try to be very, very careful. I've talked to uh, friends at NIH who have led the complementary and integrative medicine uh, division. I've been an FDA patient representative myself and take very seriously creating safe and effective medications. And so to be able to look at the long history and extensiveness of the research around coffee um, and the, you know, the well regard of the re- names of the researchers who um, have have done it. It's with great confidence that I'm able to recommend coffee to my fellow, you know, patients and those who do not want to become patients. There's really nothing else that I can think of that's in just sort of common regular use that has that same scientific evidence base confirmed around it. It sounds like you're telling me coffee can be used not just preventatively, but also for recovery. And I'm missing Actually, I missed a really important thing to dig into earlier when you said you can get those benefits by drinking decaf. So this is not an association with the caffeine in coffee. This is an association with coffee itself, correct? This is about the coffee, the, the, the components of the, of the coffee itself. I find that there's a lot of confusion or what seems to be confusion between either consumers of coffee or people who won't drink coffee because they have ideas about how it's maybe not good for them. Why do you think there's this disconnect? What, what do you think is causing this? And what is your response to that disconnect? I think that there has been some misinformation that has gone around. I think that there is also misunderstandings about um, chemicals or components that exist in nature I, I equate it in, in, in this, this may be a bad analogy, but uh, when I watch pharmaceutical advertising on television, they name all of these different, you know, uh, side effects. And I turned to my husband, you know, and some of these medications we know, and I'm like, but that occurred in only like 0. 0.00, oh, you know, uh, you know, patient. And he's like, I'm like, mm. what are they including it? The relative harms. Um, of something or or relative amounts of some naturally occurring chemicals uh, that may come out in a process have been elevated or equated with the protective components of coffee. And that's just, it's, it's bad math, <laughs> one. It's bad mm-hmm. science. And it not only becomes confusing for people, 
but it becomes misleading and and mis and to the point where it's misinforming people. When I talk about it, back in my legal career, we would talk about you know the preponderance of evidence or overwhelming evidence and without reasonable doubts. And I think coffee can be talked about in the same in the same way. You have this huge, long-standing, confirmed and reconfirmed and revalidated set of evidence done in multiple countries and multiple types of research settings um, and multiple types of trial design. You don't see that in many other things. And so the fact that again and again, through all those different types of research, the positive benefits of coffee are reaffirmed is why I feel, you know, so confident in saying it, you know, and as a Mm -hmm. patient myself, as somebody who, you know, has liver disease, has had a liver transplant, I don't take any, you know, sort of recommendations lightly, you know, it's, it's my job, my honor, my privilege to curate information for patients and help them, you know, weed out the the good from the bad. But at the end of the day, there there are so many of these, uh, you know, whether it's a medication or food that I'm talking about, it's not uh, like a third person thing. I, you know, these are things that affect me and my and my liver health. I'm right along with everybody else um, evaluating this information and trying to optimize my liver health. My listeners like to have an answer for things, as do I, Mm -hmm. you know, just to have like, hey, what is the go to research if somebody tries to question me about coffee and liver health? But it sounds to me like you're saying it's less about one research or one, a really thorough uh, maybe meta-analysis sort of research, which would be reliable on its own. But you're mm-hmm. talking more about like a multiplicity of evidence or exactly. the idea that there's just uh, so you know, much. I'm going to give you know credit to my colleagues at the British Liver Trust who put together a fantastic, and I'm actually looking through it, 86 page report compiling so much of the research around coffee. And it includes references from patient societies, medical societies, um, and, you know, in journals. And so they've done such a great job in putting all of this information together. I don't want to try to recreate the wheel. It is, Mm. you know, one easy place for people to find you know, a great compilation to answer questions that they may have based on, as we talked about, decaffeinated coffee. Um, They have Mm -hmm. the curated research there. They have research about coffee and fatty liver disease, as I was discussing, versus coffee and viral hepatitis, which is different, but still positive benefits. And then several different studies about coffee reducing the risk for um, hepatocellular carcinoma or HCC, which is liver cancer. So um, mm, okay. I would I would point people to this BritishLiverTrust.org.uk. Really great yeah. paper on coffee consumption and the liver that they did in, in excellent. Well, off the top of your head, do you, is, do you know of a tipping point or a threshold with coffee? How much should we consider drinking to start to see these health benefits? Or or is there like a tipping point on the other end where, where maybe, you know, a little too much is, is not good? Looking at these different studies and polling the different doctors that I've worked with, everyone's standard, you know, two cups of coffee. And that's like coffee, not whipped cream and pumpkin spice. I hate to break it to a lot of people. You're like, really oh, breaking some people's hearts right now. Two real cups of that have coffee in them <laughs> um, yeah. uh, is, what you, is what you need. And, um, you know, up to five cups should be, should be fine for most people. That'll probably be dependent mm, upon, okay. you know, people's weight and, and things like that. But uh, one to five cups of coffee is what the recommended is. You know, there are people who definitely are fine, you know, drinking more. God love them. Mm -hmm. Um, There are definitely, you know, some who um, can drink one and bing, bing, bing around the wall. So, you know, you'll have to listen to your own body and that and that response. But two cups of coffee, you know, as we lead towards colder months, everybody should have a sigh of relief and wrap their hands around, uh, you know, a warm mug of coffee in the morning. And as they, you know, brace themselves for yet another Zoom call in the afternoon, have a little more coffee and feel confident that they are doing 
something for their health, even as they're hmm. sitting there. So maybe they're also stand up every once in a while too, but, <laughs> uh, which, yeah. which, which can never hurt. But, um, but, but drinking that coffee would definitely be something that as the head of the Global Liver Institute, I would highly recommend for people to do. You have been doing some uh, video content from what I understand, maybe some webinars with the topic of COVID. I'm curious if you believe coffee plays a role in the world of COVID as it concerns our health and our liver health specifically, what role might coffee play there? Well, you know, the Global Liver Institute has um, a COVID-19 response program that we set up in early March. Um, and we do a uh, live Facebook uh, conversation with experts every week. I'd love to have folks come on and talk about coffee. You know, in fact, our, our highest viewed um, episode was on eating for liver health. Maybe we need its corollary of what you need to, you know, what beverages you need to drink for liver health. And that can mm-hmm. be uh, our new highest rated um episode. People want to know actionable things to have some sense of control during during these really upsetting times. And so um, we'd love to, you know, invite a conversation about coffee and liver health for, for our audiences on, uh, on GLI Live. What are you working on? You, you mentioned the COVID um, project that you have going, but what else are you working on and how can our listeners be a part of what you have going? Personally, I've been working on uh, caffeinated before I jump on my Peloton bike and, uh, and, and <laughs> achieving a new personal record um, because uh, I'm looking at that literature of the role of, of you know, coffee and athletic performance has been mm. of interest to me. Professionally, for the Global Liver Institute, um, we welcome people to spread the word about the importance of liver health first and and foremost. We have several initiatives around uh, liver cancer, for example, that will be ramping up in the month of October. We think October is for livers. Um, So if people would... Mm. um, you know, go to our website, globalliver.org, and let us know uh, what they'd like to see and, and amplify our message, particularly in throughout the month of October. That would be really appreciated as we share so much uh, information about liver health and how people can prevent liver cancer in addition to drinking mm. coffee to do so. It's actually kind of cool. Uh, the podcast, we have this uh, semi popular concept of spooky coffee it's coffee it, we always do this in october too we talk mm-hmm. about coffee that we drink that we're like sort of embarrassed to drink so that's like the really frothy sugary stuff <laughs> and so we hash we hashtag you know spooky coffee mm-hmm. but i can see there'd actually be a really cool overlap so before we get to our very last question i just want to ask you what's the philosophy behind being patient driven at the podcast we like to say we're were people focused coffee talk and it, and it sounds really similar and so i'm i'm curious about that sure so um being t- patient driven has several different aspects of it one i am the sort of primordial patient for 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 this purpose um because on the 20th anniversary of my transplant i i was really thoughtful and i i wasn't at all certain that other patients coming behind me would have the same level of access to care and to innovative, high quality care that saved my life and sustains me today. And so uh, I guess I was the first patient driver in my vision for what a, a, an advocacy organization could do in the liver health space was first. But it's sustained by patients being involved in the creation and shaping of our programs. Um, now there are, you know, liver patients who are graduates of our Advanced Advocacy Academy who are on staff in the organization. It's it's really thinking about patients at every level from our board, um, through our interns, through focus groups, and making sure that we are solving problems that matter to patients. Inevitably, they'll solve problems that matter to other people too. But if we keep mm-hmm. our focus on solving problems that matter to patients, 
we think we will have made liver health and healthcare as a whole better. And you can only do that by actively involving patients um, in not only the work, but in the decision making. The best piece of advice I've ever been given is, and I'm looking at it now, uh, tacked to my board so I don't forget it, um, is to breathe. Right. And I think that solves a lot of a lot of problems and 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 keeps one from from running into a lot of problems or at least causing them. Hmm. So um, breathe is the best piece of advice. the The takeaway for for your listeners, for for people who are drinking coffee and uh, you know thinking about drinking coffee um, for their liver health or for for other reasons. I have found is however big or bold you're thinking, think bolder. Um, I, I've, you know, never, um, the only thing I've ever regretted is not doing something or only doing it halfway um, or only doing it with half the people involved or not telling enough people or in the instance of building an organization, if I can build it for you know, my town or the U.S., if the problem's a global problem, why not build it for the world? That's what I would leave people with. It's always a wonderful thing to find out something you love to enjoy is also good for you. So next time someone judges you for your second or third cup of coffee in the day, just kindly remind them you've got a coffee date with your liver and you would hate to be late. More coffee and nutrition up on our next episode. After that, sensory science with scientists from UC Davis you won't want to miss. Thanks for tuning in. As always, and until next time, happy brewing.